Welcome back to the McCowan Podcast. Dave Hodge in for Bob today. Uh, and uh, this is a special one. Uh, you know, for the last three and a half years, we have uh, gone around the world, certainly all over North America, to talk about sports, just sports. Oh, every once in a while, Mansbridge comes on and we talk about the news. Uh, we, we broaden our, our outlook today. Jim Cuddy, the lead singer of Blue Rodeo. Jim Cuddy, the great Canadian entertainer, joins us. And this is where, Jim, I actually take a step back and let Dave take over. Oh, dear. Uh, how's that, David? <laughs> you better ask Jim if it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, pre, it's prearranged. It's so, okay. you know, so, so just just his background, I, you know, I, I've, I've known Dave since the late 70s, and you know, he's always had this uh, affection for music. But now I, 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 I truly believe Dave isn't... Uh, one of our country's best sports announcers. I think he's a, mu a music aficionado that dabs and dabbles now in sports every once in a while. Is that fair, Dave? Well, yeah, I wouldn't say affection. I would say affliction <laughs> or addiction. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, it, it grabbed me early in life and hasn't let go. And for the longest time, I've wanted to do a show like this that um, deals with what I will call the, the fascinating link between the two worlds of sports and, and music that, that make up my life. And let me simplify it this way. Um, I meet a musician, he or she wants to know inevitably who's going to win the Stanley Cup. And for that moment, I don't care because I want to know about their, their next record. And I think Jim is the perfect guest to help us uh, understand why it happens like that. It's in both of us. We're not alone, are we, Jim? No, no, absolutely not. No, it's it, it's it is uh, industry wide. Well, you and I have plenty of discussions, but let me take myself out of it, and I'll substitute a, a mutual friend, Paul Coffey, who would hope to join us. In fact, and maybe if this works, we can do that uh, another time. But uh, when you and Paul are together, um, I'm told, and I've seen. It's as if Paul never wore a pair of skates uh, <laughs> when, he, when he's loose in a room with musicians. Tell tell some Paul Coffey music stories. <laughs> well, well, Paul, most of my communication with Paul now is he sends me screenshots of what he's listening to on the radio <laughs> with very cryptic uh, texts underneath. Sometimes it's Blue Rodeo, sometimes it's Bruce, often it's Bruce Springsteen. Um, but uh Paul is one of those fascinating uh, savants that that was perhaps one of the best skaters the NHL's ever known. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that he could tell you why that was. I think that Paul just knew what to do. Like so many geniuses, he just had this innate ability to do it. So, you know, we've always, uh, way back when, when I met Paul and he came out to our, our little beer league skate, people would ask him all kinds of questions. He could tell all the stories about the NHL, but he couldn't really, he certainly couldn't make anybody better by trying to give them any secrets about, about skating. And I've been around Paul a lot more with music. And one of the things I think I told you in the last, we were last talking is he, uh, he knows uh, a lot of people in Springsteen's organization. And we went down to a sound check one time at, at the, at the um, Scotiabank place. And, um, when Springsteen finally came out, he and Paul were talking and they just talked about arenas they played in and what it was like to play music in the arena, what it was like to play hockey in the arena. And they, all they did was exchange those kind of stories, you know, and uh, it was it was it was pretty fascinating. Paul is a Paul is a real he has the the music affliction, too. He loves music. Well, well, it's interesting you say that because uh, uh, my son has for when he was in a teenager, teenager w went to a, a goalie school. Benoit Lair's goalie school just outside of Montreal. And one of the kids that he tagged along with for two or three years was Max Weinberg's son. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and, and Wein, the Weinbergs, Max and Betsy Weinberg, are crazy New Jersey Devils fans. Uh, and their son was trying to become a goalie. And they, and they said, well, a, a friend of the family has recommended that our son go to this goalie school in, in uh, St. Estache, Quebec. And they always said, well, who's the friend? Well, Martin Brodeur. So, 
Well, well, that uh, that also that same that same uh, Springsteen concert. He uh, Paul was talking to Max because I guess that they had somehow exchanged information because they were talking about goalie pads, and I think that Paul was was getting him. So uh, we were with uh, I was with another friend and and Paul, and then Max was talking very nicely, and then he said to Paul, "Would you like to come and join us for dinner?" Now this is after sound check, and I know as a musician that Max wanted us to say no. Because nobody really wants outsiders to come. <laughs> That's to this, not right? Paul. That's not yeah, Paul. So at all. Paul, Paul, and my friend go, yeah, well, I, well, that'd be great. And I had to say, guys, our wives are actually waiting for us in a restaurant, in a restaurant, having ordered for us. We can't do this. And as we were walking away, I said, you don't understand. They did not want. He did not want you to come. He he wanted you to say, oh, we have other plans, but thanks very much. That's great. <laughs> So, so the the whole concept that you talked about Paul's great skating ability and the great ability of athletes to play the game, do you do you view the way you approach music the same way? Is this a, just a something you can't explain, or or quite frankly, Jim, have you had to work hard at it every day since the day you picked up a guitar? Well, first of all, I think that's a great question because I, I think that, that that really gets to the heart of things. I think when you when I'm around professional musicians, there is a shared understanding of how to play music and what they have to do. Certainly, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. I'm I'm around mostly veteran musicians, but people that that have put hundreds of hours into to playing their craft. Now, when I go to a, when I'm around people that are not professional musicians. I recognize the difference. I recognize that that people that are pros have some kind of innate knowledge of how to do what they want to do. Maybe they're not maybe they're not al already there. Maybe they have to work at getting there. But they understand when things are in tune. They understand how a uh, song structure uh, should be put together. And and that's not something that everybody shares. So so I do see the same thing. I think that I could describe what I do better than Paul could describe what he does. But <laughs> well, when John said he was taking a back seat and I, I was driving the bus here, I didn't know he had great, <laughs> great, great questions in his back pocket. By the way, Jim, he's been saying that about me since the seventies too. I, you know, you're not supposed to have the good questions. <laughs> Look, I, I I've been in in your crowds, if you will, with uh, athletes, with players who admire your ability to make what you do look easy. Um, are there nerves? I mean, do you do you walk on stage uh, and and just it's just natural after all these times, or is there a moment where you say? Um, you know, you swallow hard and you say, I got to be at my best and, and you feel pressure. Uh, I think that uh, uh, that's, uh, again, it's so, so much part of our, our world. So <clears throat> we all think that when we're backstage and we're usually there a couple of hours, even, if, you know, many hours before we play. And if civilians, we call them, come into <laughs> our world a half an hour before we play, that's the only time when we realize that we're in a very different state of mind and that social engagement does not go well. People are internalizing things and, and we can talk to each other very easily and keep the same kibitzing going that we've been having uh, the whole time. But, but we're not in a normal state. And, we're, and, and I think that that's uh, a way of assuaging any kind of nerves. Because if you're nervous when you go on stage, that's not a good thing. I, I think that you then would have a chance, you'd have a tendency to be too, too self-conscious and not do what you know you can do, what you've practiced to do and, and what comes naturally. So I would say we are not nervous before we go on stage. However, we're not in our normal frame of mind either. And uh, and I think that's a big part of, of being a pro. You know, I, I mean, I remember in university, I learned guitar from a guy who I will never be uh, close to as good a guitar player as he is. But he did not have the temperament to be a professional musician. It made him too nervous to be on stage. It diminished his skill when he got on stage. And it certainly diminished his creativity. But he certainly had it in spades. I mean, he could just sit in a room and play beautifully and sing. And So it is a different... I mean, often, I know you know this, Dave. You'd be a bunch of, around a bunch of musicians. And they seem kind of 
shy and socially inept. You know, they seem like they're, you wonder how they get up on a stage. And yet I think it's that, it's that very thing that, that they have overcome way earlier in life to get up on a stage and feel like they are the focus and they need to do this and they don't even think about it by the time they hit stage.